Cognizant of Canada is delighted to partner with the Jaipur Literature Festival. There's an exciting lineup of conversations with authors and artists from around the world. Several Canadian participants will be discussing themes such as gender equality and women's empowerment. Canada remains committed to advancing these shared values with our partners and allies from around the world. And this festival is an important forum for cultural diplomacy, allowing countries to better understand and learn from each other. I'd like to extend my best wishes to all participants, whether you're attending virtually or in person. Happy festival. On behalf of our festival director, Namita Gokhale, festival advisors, and my colleagues at Team Bacarts, we welcome you all to the Festival Directors Roundtable 2022. As we gear up for the ninth edition of Jaipur Bookmark, held in parallel with the 15th edition of Jaipur Literature Festival, we reinforce JBM's role as an important B2B segment aimed at developing and nurturing the business of books and literary and arts festivals across the world. This year, the festival will take place from the 5th to the 14th of March 2022 in a hybrid format. Literature in the Times of Conflict. Catherine McLean, Christina Fentresla Roche, Catherine Gruen, Margaret Walso, Sadaf Saz in conversation with Sanjoy K. Roy. In these times of conflict, literature can play a vital role in allying a fear of the other, providing an opportunity to understand other cultures, philosophies, religions, and history. Do literary festivals have a vital role in mirroring the turmoil and conflict of our times and our societies from climate crisis to forms of government, war and migration to issues of minorities and economic turmoil, while giving a perspective on vital issues that shape public discourse. Our festival directors come together to explore their role in programming and the need for inclusive action. Catherine McLean is the director of the board of the Hong Kong International Literary Festival and president and managing director at Sutton Communications. She's a cultural communication professional with more than a decade's experience directing strategic campaigns for the world's leading arts organizations. Christina Fuentesla Roche is international director at Hay Festival, where she has worked since 2005. She has been involved in creating and directing these festivals in areas including Colombia, Spain, Mexico, Lebanon, and Peru. She's currently interim CEO. Catherine Gruen is the director of PR and communications at Frankfurter Brechmisi. She joined Frankfurter Brechmisi in 2009 after working as head of press at the German Film Museum, Film Institute, and at various publishers. She earned her MA degree in American Studies, Modern Literature and Comparative Literature at the University of Bonn. Margaret Walso is the director of Norla Norwegian Literature Abroad. Her former position was as publisher in a publishing house for several years. She's the author of two historical novels and holds a master's degree in Nordic literature and languages. Sadaf Saas is a poet, writer, entrepreneur and women's rights advocate. She is the festival director and producer of Dhaka Lit Fest, which she co-founded in 2011. She runs an arts management and production company in Dhaka, along with a performance space. She's a member of the Bangladeshi women's activist organization, Nari Poko, and has done research, critiques, advocacy, and activism in the areas of violence against women, women's political participation, women's legal rights, women's health and reproductive rights, and sexuality. She promotes science and technology in Bangladesh and recently started a clinical research and biotech company. Sadaf is the author of a collection of poems, Sari Reads. Her monologues based on Bangladeshi women's stories, Je Kotha Je Na Bola, have been performed in various locations in Bangladesh. She's currently working on a novel. Sanjoy K. Roy, an entrepreneur of the arts, is the managing director of Team Book Arts, producers of the Jaipur Literature Festival and GLF and 25 other festivals across the world, and is a founder trustee of Salam Balak Trust, providing support services for street and working children in Delhi. Roy works closely with the various industry bodies and the government on policy issues in the cultural sector in India and has lectured and collaborated with international universities. This virtual roundtable will be available to view later on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Ladies and gentlemen, literature in the times of conflict. Catherine McLean, Christina Fuentes La Roche, Catherine Gruen, Margaret Walso, Sadaf Saz in conversation with Sanjoy K. Roy. Welcome, Catherine, Sadaf, Kat, and Christina. Absolutely delighted to have you all uh, as part of our Festival Directors Roundtable, which we would have loved to do as we normally do in flesh and blood. But sadly, that's not to be this year. Um, for all of you listening out there, we've had the digital festival of the Jaipur Literature Festival going on, started on the 5th, and it continues to the 14th. And we're on ground from the 10th to the 14th in Jaipur, and we'll, of course, be broadcasting those sessions live as well. Uh, we're in a really difficult space, even as the world is emerging out of the pandemic, 
bracing itself for perhaps one or two more uh, rounds, we seem to be caught up yet again in an era of conflict, and this time with the threat of nuclear war. Uh, so many people are suffering every day streaming into our television screens and our homes. We see the visuals of tanks parading the streets, bombing the cities, uh, while women and children continue to flee. Like I've always said, all wars are wars against its women and children. What then is the role of literature in uh, today's world? How can literature help uh, by focusing on the history of the past to try and make sense of the present? And of course, envision perhaps a, a brighter future uh, for those who we will uh, leave behind. I'm going to start straight with uh, Sadaf. Sadaf, Bangladesh celebrates its 50th anniversary since the first, since its war for independence uh, in 1971. And you've been through the entire gamut of conflict, of migration, of refugees. How has this played out in literature? And how do you see or how do you view literature as being important to make sense of the world that we are in? Uh, it's been 50 years. There's been an outpouring of stories this year from both sides of uh, the border, both in India and in Bangladesh. Why is memory so important and even more so today? Well, th thank you so much for having me to this. And uh, yes, I think, uh, as you know, uh, literature and culture has, has been integral to, you know, our ancient civilization and, and how we came to be how we are today uh, through kind of years of uh, syncretic and pluralistic um, amalgamation that, that kind of, uh, I guess, gave us that confidence to uh, stand up and and uh, and fight for our rights in in a very similar way to what we see in Ukraine now so you know our hearts go out to um you know everyone who's in Ukraine in fact a friend of mine uh, in Dhaka who's been involved with the festival for many years her parents are in in Ukraine now um I, so I think that uh you know, literature has, has been very important to us and our language has been very important to us. And as we uh, kind of step into like our 50th year, um, I think, as you know, there's there's been a lot of success stories about Bangladesh, the story of Bangladesh, where all this kind of enthusiasm and um, energy and, and of a young country that's also been able to kind of tap into the wisdom of its past. A lot of that has been through our stories and our literature. And just going back to why we had the festival in the first place, it's because, you know, we felt that we, it was becoming a bit insular. We weren't really um, following in the tradition that we had, which was kind of bringing in the best and imbibing the best from abroad and also kind of showcasing what we had um, and letting our young people kind of um, I, I guess take all of that in so um, where, where we started the festival as it being a celebration we ended up finding it was a very important place to explore our history to talk about many of the things that you know had not been talked about for many years uh, to um, uh, I guess explore the nuances of of the different, you know, gradations of what we thought. So in, in I think in, in this year, 2022 and 2023, I really do feel that, you know, as we were coming out of the pandemic where, where everybody was in their kind of, you know, social media silos, we did feel it was a very important space to kind of explore the gradations of, of experience, of memory, of identity. Um, and what we're going through, um, you know, Bangladesh is going through, as everyone else, kind of having to face climate change as ground zero, migration um, is happening, climate uh, change migration is happening in a big way. Um, but also, I kind, I think the geopolitical place we find ourselves in now, where, you know, um, we have two big 
uh, forces on either side of us, India, China, and then of course we have relationships with everyone in the world. How to navigate this, how to kind of balance our future with um, the colonial past and our, our understanding of how we got here, you know, and the unfair and fairness of it all, but also, you know, how to kind of, it, you know, take that on. And that's where I think even when we're, we're looking at novels, for example, or even in a novel, you can have a lot of different perspectives. So just, I guess, introducing even children to the, the um, form of different types of creative expression. Uh, I think that's also going to be really important. So now if I'm going to come back to you about climate change and of course, Bangladesh and its future, and it's fairly rosy future, even as it goes up the economic GDP contribution scale. But Christina, one of the things that Sadaf talked about was language and the importance of language and memory. And we've seen that in certainly in the Latin American uh, uh, countries and more so even Wales, for example, why language plays such an important role. The fear of the other, the fear of the unknown that we keep talking about, and we've seen that now more and more in Europe. We've seen it uh, pretty much across every refugee uh, area. That fear of the other has become so strong uh, that people are refusing to take in, of course, refugees from war torn places or economically problematic places. And much of this narrative has moved from what used to be known as the third world, say the Africas and subcontinents of the world and has literally moved across the world. In, in your festival, and I'm talking about uh, both your festival in, in South uh, America and America, and of course in Wales, how do you see language playing that important role? And why is it so important for us to focus on translation and nuance to get these stories of the soil of conflict, of war, of trials and tribulations out there? Thank you, Sanjoy. Thank you for inviting me. Very happy to be here with all of you. And, um, you know, language, I think, is, um, is a very important um, item. And um, I think, um, you know, the world is in conflict. Our because of the pandemic as well, our world has narrowed down. You know, we have uh, a, for two years only talked to our neighbors in a physical way, or our, our bubbles. And I think festival has has um, has worked as a window to the world, a window to connect with each other. And um, and I think um, you know a, the important thing is um, a, you know to understand our own culture, to protect what we have as uh, our own independent language in Wales. Uh, you know the Welsh language but to connect it to the rest of the world. And I think this, um, the world has become as well very polarized, you know, like, um, and um, social media doesn't help. Everything is black, black and white. So I think it's very important what you said and what um, Sadaf said about the nuances. I think the festivals are places to explore all the different grace, all the dif different um, um, palette that um, conversations, ideas, uh, conflicts, different, different ways of thinking has. So, you know, um, so I think festivals are places to mix um, languages, translation. I mean, there are many art forms of travels without translation, like music, for example, but, um, but books, we need, uh, you know, we cannot um, read all the languages of the world, but we, 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 have, we can connect uh, by, by great, great translators and, um, and interpreters. So I think it's, um, is uh, festivals are a good place to 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 get um, different languages together and um, and explore uh, what makes makes us um, um, be the same and what makes us different as well. And um, yeah, I think um, what has been very interesting as well about language, about territory in the digital world, is how do you translate this idea of each festival being rooted to a place. In the digital sphere, and we have been we have been doing this by, um, for example, if we get Malala to speak in our digital festival in Mexico, Malala will speak to a Mexican activist Lydia Cacho. So the viewpoint of all our digital festivals are from the place it originates, even if it can be enjoyed and consumed by anyone in the world. Lydia Cacho is going to ask Malala questions that relates to the reality of Mexico. So that conversation, even if it is digital, becomes unique and site specific. So I think it's very important not to lose that in the digital world, especially when the festivals are connected 
to real physical places and, and you know all the conversations can be enjoyed by anyone or we can learn a lot from everyone but the viewpoint is always from the place the festival originates and that's something we have been learning to do so for example Paul Krugman the Nobel Prize winner in Colombia he speaks with a great Colombian um, um, or Latin American um, economist so so he brings him into the reality of the of the of the space and conversation we're having even if even in a digital format so i think um you know this idea of um of festivals i think it's very important not to lose the link with the physicality of the place it is with the languages with the with the you know the territory as well catherine christina talked about place being so important now we know that hong kong has been going through its own evolution it's, it is been in the center of the world's attention everybody's been looking at it looking at some of the conflicts that have been going on there where the very sense of freedom is taking on a new meaning even if students have been taken off the streets protests have happened and your whole media has changed in that kind of situation and with a fairly narrow bandwidth that you have to be able to operate how do you negotiate this issue of conflict, conflict on the street, conflict of the stories of so many people who become involved with it, at the same time balancing the needs of the new reality that you find yourself in? Um, yeah, exactly. I think, as, as you say, you know, Hong Kong has had an interesting, um, you know, few years and sort of challenges, you know, here and of course, you know, the backdrop of the pandemic as well and kind of the challenges the world over and the kind of, you know, issues we've all been facing. So I feel, um, you know, we've all kind of been part of that that wider narrative. But I guess in, you know, in, in Hong Kong in particularly in, in for the Hong Kong International Literary Festival, you know, our mission really is around, um, you know, creating that dialogue, um, creating a platform for understanding, for sharing ideas, for different perspectives to come together um, and for, for looking at that from multiple different different ways, in multiple different angles, agendas, ideas, um, and kind of allowing that is a, as a place for people to come together. And I think, you know, it's really interesting what Christina was saying around the kind of the virtual and the local and how we kind of bring that, you know, together in Hong Kong as well. We are programming, we have lots of great, you know, young Hong Kong writers looking at what they're, they're you know, um, what they're talking about, what they're writing about, um, you know, sort of nonfiction works, but also, you know, his, history as well, it's incredibly popular and in kind of looking at, at, at that as well, you know, in Hong Kong and Hong Kong's history. So, you know, it has been, it has been an interesting time, but sort of, you know, really sort of bringing people together, it has been important too, to keep, to keep that dialogue. Um, and then to also keep um, bringing in international writers, writers from, you know, the world, even not, not bringing them in physically at the minute, but bringing them in virtually um, to those discussions and kind of having that, um, you know, dialogue, you know, beyond, uh, beyond the local, you know, scene as well, and kind of keeping those perspectives is really important. So um, it's been, yeah, it's been, a, it, you know, we've just had the, the previous festival in November, um, which was well attended with hybrid. So we had lots of um, in-person events, which were possible at that time, and online events. And we had a real mixture of kind of Hong Kong local speakers, but some, um, you know, world-renowned authors as well joining um, for quite a, a breadth of different topics. Catherine, the world looks at, at least certainly Europe and the East looks at the Frankfurt Book Fair as sort of the, the mother of all business book fairs, place to come to do so much work. And yet you've had to reinvent your model uh, since COVID came. And now with the threat of war looming, how do you see this being reflected in the fair? That's one. And more importantly, are you seeing the possibilities of how literature can address some of these issues that have become so vital in Europe. We are seeing two completely different perspectives. Russia's uh, uh, issue, which is NATO is encroaching on its territory. Uh, NATO's issue, Russia trying to push back on NATO, despite the fact that all three powers signed up uh, to guarantee Ukraine uh, its uh, freedom and it was one of the first few countries to demilitarize and of course, remove uh, its nuclear weaponry. And yet years down the line, all of that has fallen 
uh, by the wayside. How will that be reflected or how do you feel that play out uh, in the Frankfurt Book Fair and much of the writing that you, that's going to come to you uh, later this year? Yes, thank you. Um, so our hearts um, and our prayers are with the Ukrainian people, of course, and we have gar guaranteed them all the support we could give them. And also this year we have suspended our cooperation with the uh, Russian federal agencies who are in charge of the national Russian stand in Frankfurt. Because what we are witnessing here, the aggression that we witness, uh, is something unprecedented in the in, in the nearer history of, of Europe, and it absolutely needs a clear a clear stand, uh, which which we have um, um, already made made known. Um, I, I also want to say that um, we also see that there are a lot of Russian authors and uh, and scientific scientists who are protesting against the Putin regime, and this uh, is an enormous courage courageous. Uh, reaction and they are also putting their lives to risk. So I just want to say that um, by by suspending our cooperation with the federal agencies, this doesn't mean that we do not include Russian authors and Russian independent publishers into our programs. We think it is very important to really keep up the dialogue and to um, to to you know this is what Frankfurt stands for. In in the long history of the fair, next year we will be celebrating our seventy fifth uh, anniversary. And Frankfurt has always made it a point to include both sides of the conflict, you know, which also means that there is conflict in Frankfurt as well, because you know, autocratic states they will they will come to Frankfurt and they will face demonstrations and they will face protests, and this is something that they will have to deal with. Uh, and, and we have always made it a point to sort of to have them both here and to try to establish the dialogue in Frankfurt as well. Catherine, you talked about, you know, it's fascinating to hear you saying that uh, officially you all will boycott uh, the Russian uh, book agency, but you'll be happy to welcome uh, authors, writers, independent publishers. Tell us in, in your point of view, I mean, you know, finally you're sitting in Frankfurt, is in Germany, you're in Germany. Tell us the role of history. Why is history so important today? We saw the Time magazine cover, which shows uh, the merger of Putin and, and Hitler in the way that it was ripped off, uh, which was a fascinating cover in recent times. Why is history so important? Why do we need to engage with history and what do we need to learn from? Well, I think that history also plays a part in 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 current days. You know, everybody who is coming to Frankfurt and who is exposing their cultural products and their books, and and they also bring uh, bring bring their recent history. And I think it's it's really important that in the in the talks and in the discussions um, we are offering and we are establishing in Frankfurt, this is be also part of the um, of the discussion because we don't come from nowhere. It, it is just um, it is just very important to to sort of be to inform ourselves about what is going on in the world and when I mentioned earlier that Frankfurt has always made it a point in including the both sides of the parties this goes back I mean I remember that one of the predecessors of the book fair directors he made he really wanted to have China on board uh, in the Frankfurt um, exhibitor lines and, and China had the conflict with Taiwan and still has it very acutely uh, but we still sort of try to represent both uh, both countries no matter how um, how the conflicts are because Frankfurt is a is sort of a territory where you were trying to do the discussions with in peace you know so so that's really the point of Frankfurt so the uh, point of peace both perspectives what is the role of literature festivals or do they have a role? especially today, you know, with the narrative of hatred that seems to be pouring out. Do festivals have a role and a responsibility to push back? Or should festivals, as Catherine said, represent all points of view? How do we sort of make sense of this going forward? Many of us are sort of overwhelmed by the hatred that pours out, especially on social media and on traditional media. I mean, uh, like you all, we get attacked a lot for both leaning to the left or leaning to the right. What is our role in this new uh, world where hatred seems to be the dominant narrative and many of us still continue 
to try and walk that center line of let's have both sides being presented or both sides of the of the coin being presented i i totally kind of like add to what you you just said uh, sanjay that uh, that's exactly you know i think what we are here for it is try and kind of make sense of it all by giving as wide a perspective as possible um and i because there is such polarity it it re i think this is a space that i think is so necessary um you know when we're i think we're we're all talking about like different types of freedom of expression and of course writing is a political act whatever um we're featuring will have controversy will have um a range of different perspectives uh and uh, you know i i really i think this is going to be challenge more and more challenging but this idea of pushing back as well i mean this idea of what we used to sort of see public intellectuals speak out and talk about um who are these public intellectuals now uh, you know i think there's a dearth of of um this this kind of bold um uh, expression of things that need to be said it's it's like this idea of just you know being silent is not enough anymore you, it's con condoning a lot of what's going on but then uh considering a lot of the situation that we're in sometimes uh being able to have a platform where you can express something uh in different ways um you know in in ways that are not maybe so obvious but everybody understands um and very creative ways so this is perhaps our uh, one of the roles is is uh, uh, you know not only have you know sort of straightforward different points of view being um expressed when you're maybe discussing a work of non-fiction but also uh as you said um and, you know i think you've been doing it in jaipur ex explain the explore the range of creative forms so that people can be creative in in having to expre express i can, i think the nuance of uh, and and also the breadth of what we're all experiencing without necessarily um being so obvious about it a cat of you know creative ways of expressing dissent this i think hits home as far as you go in hong kong today where if you're a media baron or a media tycoon with a different narrative from the established one by the authorities you know you lose your voice how are you seeing that playing out especially through your festival obviously is going to become more and more problematic uh, when you explore issues like this will this mean that you will not be able to explore issues of dissent or will you as sadaf said have to do it far more creatively rather than in your face and is there a new outpouring of writing since the dissent that has come into being in hong kong um i think you know hong kong i mean i think you know hong kong is a really creative um place to be and um by no means is you know the arts and the culture scene here in any way you know stifled it's such a rich um and fantastic place for the arts and culture in hong kong we've got you know new museums opening um galleries art fairs festivals a lot of a lot going on in the sort of the arts and culture scene here um which is which is really great to see and i think you know for our festival as well um you know we we haven't uh you know we we've, we've continued to program exciting interesting um events bringing together different voices um and really championing you know young writers and and sort of hong kong um you know Uh, we've done lots of workshops sort of writing workshops um exploring different challenges so we had one which was writing through difficult times in the in the recent festival um our, our last festival was around the themes of mental health and resilience and um you know rebound um and kind of you know a lot of kind of sort of therapy through books or kind of people finding um you know uh sort of comfort through reading and expressing themselves through reading and writing so um you know that can go in many many different different ways different directions um you know through through challenging times we kind of come together and and sort of uh find uh find sort of help through through those sessions so um you know i think i definitely think there's you know a vibrant 
seen here and uh, the festival's got an important role to play to, to ensure that continues as well and that we continue to program you know we have year-round events it's not just a sort of one-off um, festival now we have lots of programs through the year um, and it's really opportunity for people to kind of um, you know ask questions as well so the audience can come and you know engage in those q a's not just sort of sit and listen but actually put questions to authors to writers um and kind of continue that dialogue um together and by no means kind of just you know uh sort of give up or think that it's, it's not a you know place where we can come and share ideas um through literature uh, christina cat talked about mental health and we've seen that during covid that became a very accentuated issue uh, across the world with more people uh, suffering or accepting or realizing that this is the big war to be fought and it's in every home, every workplace, uh, every family is afflicted uh, by it. How do you see festivals uh, like yours, for example, which is really in the heart of, of a place where there's so much of a conflict of different kinds, whether it's the drug wars that have been happening, whether it's the migration issues, whether it's the border divides. How do you see this working through and what's the kind of uh, new writing that's come out that you've been able to focus on in this conflict? Yes, I mean, the, the mental health is like the big, one of the biggest effects of the pandemia or the second pandemia. As I said before, we have been for two years uh, living in a very small world, in our, in our little homes, our little bubbles. And, and, and we have seen the festival, festival has, has uh, served as a window to the world. When we were all in lockdown, people didn't just join to the festival to watch them. They joined to feel part of a community. The chat bar that was on the right, that was for the audience to communicate, to say hi, to exchange ideas was on fire. People wanted to feel connected to others. And then we got an average of 100 questions to each author. So there was a big need of communication. It was a big need to get out of your, your little world and your, you know, you were so fi fixed with the, with the problems with the, with the local, you know, we, and it was a nice way to be connected with the global as well. So that in an individual level, in a, in a, in a, in a wider level, you know, the conflicts we live in and um, COVID ones, uh, polarizations, um, migrations, climate change in Colombia or the, or the uh, Latin America, the drug issue. I think the festivals are places, um, we very much think we are a festival of, of literature and ideas. And we create a program talking about all these issues from different perspectives and, um, and the idea of um, mixing different, um, uh, we love to sit in a panel like a economist, an anthropologist, a policymaker, to talk about uh, one thing from different perspectives and sometimes uh, new, I don't know new new ways of seeing the same problem comes out and it really helps um, to you know to 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 get people um, asking questions thinking and um, and many themes we we program them and many themes are transversal you know like it comes out in the in the in the in the festival itself so I think uh, both things are interesting. And out of these conflicts, there is always new literature and new, new art forms um, uh, uh, becoming apparent. For example, in Latin America, there is a generation of um, especially female writers writing about violence in a new way, like Fernanda Melchor or Dolores Reyes, like uh, um, denouncing violence against women as well in a, in a, in a very fresh way all the narco literature, narco music, you know, all these conflicts as well has got its own reflections and all, all a new, new art forms, how to, to engage the reality in the artistic process of, um, of, um, of, 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 um, of the artist. So, you know, it's, um, and it's interested in, in to showcase uh, that in, in festivals. But um, something we as well, we do, we curate a program and we need to be careful to, to be balanced. We cannot just um, do a program just for the converted. But then there is always, it's, it's, I think this is a very, as um, Sadaf was saying, it's very complicated. We, we, we're operating in very polarized worlds and um, we need to invite the other as well to the festival. But, you know, for example, I remember when the New Yorker invited uh, Stephen Bannon to be part of the New Yorker Festival. And like, um, you know, 70% of the authors participating wanted to pull out. Was that a good idea? Or there is a limit? You should only invite people that uh, 
has got a minimal sense of tolerance, of uh, respect to the other. You know, there are many questions we have to ask ourselves uh, more and more, like uh, we need diversity in our program, we need equality in terms of gender, we need, um, so you know, the programmer role has become a minefield, very interesting, interesting but we need to, 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 to be in ones and create new ways of, um, of showcasing pro, uh, uh, issues. We need to be subtle, you know, like um, sometimes uh, we want to give a message, but we don't, we don't shout about it. Yeah, we do, we do it like, uh, just for example, we want to invite, uh, we did a festival in, in the Arab world and um, we got 70% of the program was female writers. We didn't say anything about it, but we just show it. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting how our role as a curator has become uh, a bit of a creating a little puzzle and and trying to <laughs> to make all the all the pieces feel without uh, without um and we need to take into account as well our sponsors who backs us up uh, our audience so you know it has become a very challenging interesting and um, and um, you know a, a job <laughs> totally I think programming is a minefield that all of us have to negotiate I know that we get into trouble all the time. <laughs> both from the left and the right every time we program somebody. And like you said, even with, with one of our iterations in the Middle East, uh, you know, one of the things we were told that you can't invite any LGBTQ, you can't talk about mm -hmm. renewable energy, and you can't have Sufi music. And we did all three without calling it that. Yeah. So absolutely, that's what we need to do. So now Christina talked about, you know, connections, about making change, about climate change primarily. Bangladesh, we know, is going to be one of the most affected countries when it comes to uh, climate change. And even now, the latest report is even a degree of, uh, of uh, you know, one degree of uh, global warming will bring untold devastation to both Bangladesh and to India. And yet, climate change, for example, is not the sexy topic of the moment. And we're not being able to find or make that difference and make that the most important issue. It's still being seen as somebody else's problem. And we're seeing that at every global conference, whether it's COP26 or across. So how do you see, or what do you think we need to do in this, which will be the greatest war uh, that humanity has to fight collectively, if collectively is possible? How do you see our role as platforms for literature to be able to make that change in uh, the conversation and build traction for this very important uh, issue. Uh, actually, I'm kind of looking at it in four ways. Uh, the first that we had touched on earlier is that the, you know there's an outpour of new stories coming out, but a lot of it is us trying to come to terms with the past about identity and uh, memory. Uh, kind of trying to get to terms with what happened in you know 47 and 52 and 71 and and so that was one part I think we haven't processed that so a lot of the new novels and stories that are coming out are still trying to kind of find a place where we are uh, and the second thing is we actually this like this past year we were part of a Tagalit Fest was part of an amazing amazing initiative um, with the Swansea University where um, we had writers from both countries being exposed to just a whole load of lectures and conversations about climate change because as you said it's like not sexy and nobody's writing about it unless a writer really wants to kind of feel engaged you don't want it to you know, uh, read like a party political broadcast or like an NGO leaflet, right? And uh, so we got some of um, our really um, exciting writers and poets to uh, engage and, and the kind of uh, creative stuff, which was some of it was totally left, left field they came up with was, was really uh, uh, incredible. So I think that that has been very exciting. Um, and um, the third thing is that I think that young people, Young people in schools and everything like that, they also kind of need to be, in, be encouraged not to write about climate change. But I think as this opens up, things that, that we're connecting to, things that, that are affecting our lives, and they don't necessarily will see it as climate change. They will see it as, you know, I have to leave my, I have to leave my town. I have to, you know, I'm, I'm, um, the, the, the river that was, that was there is now being eroded and it's, it's getting more salt water there. So, um, or this, this huge cyclone is hitting us and, and getting not just kind of urbanized 
uh, or select kind of um, writers to be uh, showcased, but also encourage um, you know the kind of writing that is happening all over Bangladesh. And the last thing is that that this excitement in, in disruption, I think hi highlighting a bit of that, because that is, I think, that's something that we can all kind of tap into. Um, on the one hand, resilience, but the other thing is the, the disruption that's going on and kind of try and document and share some of that, because that is pretty exciting as well. So the disruption in, in how uh, renewable energy is kind of affecting and, and bringing it out through stories, not as renewable energy is, is, is like, you know, an important and insulation or whatever, but it is coming out in all sorts of exciting stories of, um, of let's say, off the grid initiatives um, in the village. There's so many things that are happening in rural Bangladesh, for example. Uh, and, and I know that some of uh, some of exciting um, stories of, of how innovation is happening in, in America, which is then connecting with something that's happening in China, which is then happening something that, uh, linked to something that is happening, you know, at the grassroots level in Bangladesh. Um, so those kind of things, and as we're telling stories in different ways, uh, for example, like floating gardens, you know, off the coast in Bangladesh, those kind of stories. But uh, I, I think that the way we've been traditionally kind of documenting them, that needs a disruption. And, and perhaps literature festivals are the way to kind of encourage and kind of program that stuff in. Catherine uh, Sadaf talks about disruption. You know, in the Frankfurt Book Fair, and uh, luckily just before the lockdown, I had the opportunity to be with you all at the book fair, which is so vast and so enormous that it takes forever to get your head around it. How are you able to sort of look at, you know, making that leap between it being a place where anybody can come and book a space and you having a curated program within that, which can and should focus on whether it's young people or climate change, et cetera. How do you find that balance or is there a balance is there a need for that balance to be found? Yes, thank you for this question. Is this is this is really a very crucial one because as a as an international book fair um, with the the huge size of it that Frankfurt has, um, we are not we are not an entity who actually makes censorship. So so basically, we will allow publishers to participate in the Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, unless we know that they are persecuted or that there is something, you know, uh, they're, they're, um, they are persecuted by the federal law or so. But, but basically everybody can take part in the Frankfurt Book Fair as long as this is not the case. But this just only means that they, they will have a space in Frankfurt where they can present themselves. The other thing that we are also curating and we are, we are uh, putting a lot of emphasis on who is coming on the stages, you know, who is actually participating in panel dis discussions and, and what, what are we discussing there? I think we, we, are very, we draw a very clear line between the stages that we are curating um, and the fair, you know, where where everybody can basically uh, showcase their their works, unless they are they there is some uh, persecution. I also wanted to come back to to something that Christina said earlier uh, in her initial statement is about the role of translation and. Um, Frankfurter Buchmesse this year, we have a major topic and, and this topic is, is dedicated to translators. And our motto will be translate, transfer, transform this year. Because of course, the translators are instrumental in our, in our business and they're instrumental in, in our entire world. I mean, we just have to bear in mind the long speech that Vladimir Putin gave earlier last week. And I mean, this, the translators are so instrumental here. Um, and what we mean when we put translation into on center stage at Frankfurt Book Fair is, is of course the literary translation and the, the translation of literary works and having them travel to other parts of the world. But it also means translating literature into film or into other media, or it also means translating between conflicting parties and trying to, to, to be a, a mediator. So this is uh, what we will can expect in Frankfurt this year. And Catherine, will the Frankfurt Book Fair be in a physical presence this year? Or how are you seeing the new evolution of the form uh, since you sort of experimented with it in 2021? We are hoping we are hoping to have a physical fair because we have learned from from the past two years that that it it's it's really good to have digital. It's really good to reaching out to people and to have the audience building audience in in the entire world. But it doesn't 
it's, I mean, it doesn't replace the physical meeting. You know, it, this is all, uh, as you said, when we when we are meeting before this, I mean, the gossip, all this, you know, the, the dynamic that we have when we meet in person, you know, all this, um, yeah, I mean, this can't be replaced by a digital meeting. So we are actually hoping a lot um, to, again, be able to hold a, a physical fair. I think it will be still different from what you all know, how Frankfurt was in the past. Um, but we did hear that our exhibitors and the visitors were very happy because they had more time to engage with it, uh, each other. It wasn't, you know, it, it it wasn't very big, but but everybody had sort of time. Everybody was crying because they could see each other again, again. So I think this emotional factor is also an important uh, role in, in in Frankfurt. But of course, we will uh, we will continue to 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 digitize and to have a live stream and to to also. Uh, the B2B program was was digital last year, so I think we will we will we will continue being a hybrid fair, but the focus will be on the phys physical meeting. Thanks. I'm, I'll I'll come back to Margaret, who's just joined us a, in a bit. But Christina, coming back to you, you know, we talked about conflict and war. We talked about, of course, uh, climate change, but there are other wars and conflicts that continue. In your case, in Mexico, it's the big migration issue that. And the, and the drugs and the warlords that have really been taking a much greater toll than even presently the war that we're seeing in Ukraine in which are only 145 people. And I say only 145 is really in comparison to the vast numbers of people who die uh, in Latin American countries and in Mexico each year through violence and through uh, uh, the whole drug mafia. How does that get reflected in uh, literature? And how do you, in your festivals, on your platforms, a safeguard yourself from uh, the kind of tension that this creates, but also present a platform for writing about loss and about the history of this issue? Yes, I mean, I think festivals, what we, what we do is we, we create spaces to discuss through culture, and um, the, all these kind of issues, because all these conflicts are the Latin American conflict, Mexico, Colombia, is related to a world conflict. It's not just a local, you know, the, the drug, uh, the, 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 the drug business is uh, multinational, and, and Colombia is just one part of it. And to, and to solve this, it needs to be solved in a collective way, the same as Mexico. So I think festivals are places to to discuss the issues in a transfer, tra transversal way. I mean, we are not a news. Our role is. Um, you know, what we were saying before, you know, uh, analyzing our past, exploring our present to imagine the future. So, you know, we talk about uh, lost, about grief, about, uh, we were talking before mental health. We talk about the new art forms that comes out of these uh, uh, situations, uh, like violence, like the narco literature, like uh, a lot of literature about the feminist sites, the, the, um, the um, all the, all the violence against women, for example. And, um, um um, I don't know, and, and, and issues around uh, the social issues and the cultural issues that all these um, conflicts um, throw to, to, the, to the society. And we analyze them through a cultural way and um, through, through global conversations. I mean, if we want to talk about impunity, for example, we don't point, that, point the finger to a local conflict. We talk about impunity inviting Wale Sojinka, um, Salman Rushdie to talk about uh, uh, censorship, impunity, things. There are many subtle ways to, to discuss this issue. We are a forum, we are not a newspaper or a, or a, or a place where we um, discuss the, the horrors happening around you, but we, the, we, we go in depth into them. We, but into, the, into, into them, how it relates to us as, as human beings, how we, how we are all connected by these, by these issues. So I think we need to be very careful not to bring the, um, the pettiness of these issue, local issues into the festival. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm being a, 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 a platform to discuss this in a in depth and a rigorous way. I think um, nowadays that in social media, everybody can give their opinion. And uh, and um, as, I, as I was saying before, things become black and white because it's very polarized because of the social media. It's nice to give a space to, to thinkers, to intellectuals, to, to people that are day by day analyzing the ideas. All of this in a very inclusive, inclusive format, conversations where everybody can take part. We always say that our festivals are not just for big readers or intellectuals. 
it is for people with curiosity that wants to understand the world they live in, they, that want to go depth into the issues, analyzing the past, the present, the future, analyzing the different uh, uh, relations to other to other areas of, 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 of knowledge. So I think that's what we can provide. That's our small seed to solve um, you know, the problems we are in. You know, I think creating this platform to discuss issues from um, from different perspectives than just um, like a newspaper will do, like just showcasing what's going wrong in the moment. You know, I think the depth, the analysis, the the you know the the connection with the rest of the world is that what makes us um, special. Margaret Christina talks about deep dive and inclusivity. And earlier, uh, before you joined, we were talking about the role of translation. Norla, for example, looks at translation as one of its primary objectives. And we were talking about how translation allows you uh, to be able to understand another philosophy, another history, another world, and to some extent push back on the fear of the unknown. Tell us a little bit about why Norla, a small country, is so vested in translation. Well, yes, it's uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and it's uh, wonderful to join you uh, uh, late, but it's good to, to hear to you all and to be with you. Uh, translators are crucial for, for us uh, uh, covering such uh, a language as Norwegian so that we can be understood in the rest of the world. We have to go through translation. So, that's the understanding that we have that it, tran translation is the only way for us to 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 be able to communicate with our content ideas and um, and thoughts and of course we don't take it as uh, um, for granted that uh, enough people around the world uh, choose to study norwegian because you have to have some special interest to do it so that's why we try to to work as early as possible uh, to to motivate and to uh, to help uh, the translators uh, who choose Norwegian to get as good resources as possible. So we we visit uh, students at universities uh, around the world where they have uh, Scandinavian institutes. We we invite uh, translators to come to Oslo to stay at our translators hotel both to work but not the least to get in touch with the book industry so we see uh, we work with a lot of target groups along with the rest of the book industry in Norway but uh, the translators is the group that it's the closest to us and uh, which uh, it's the most important ambassadors for for literature uh, to spread out and to be able to bring impulses back. So that's uh, that's why we we work so uh, deeply with them. One of the biggest problems in translations, and we've certainly found it in our part of the world, and I know across Europe and European languages that's still struggling with, is the quality of translation. And how do you translate nuance uh, into a different language? I mean, for example, in whether it's in Bengali, you know, there's a there's a, a saying, which means you dust your stomach out. Uh, you know, uh, when when you go to the uh, when you go to the bathroom. Now, translating that as a nuance, as a as a way to say something, it's so difficult. How does that work, and how does Norla sort of vest itself in uh, ensuring better translators or better translations? Um, yes, it's a very good point because uh, uh, we do it through the dialogue with the translators, uh, but we don't do it as a organization to. Uh, we are not an, to control or to to test. It's more to have the discussion about it, uh, which is important. And the translators they say that it is actually impossible to translate everything something gets lost in translation but at the same time something new is also added uh, to a translation because the expression you mentioned 
will be solved in a way that maybe brings something new uh, back to the book in a way. So you lose some, but you also get some. And that's the wonderful thing about translation. So you can also say that a translation is a new book. It's, a, it's a, at least a new version of the book. So um, there are different styles uh, depending on time. Uh, some years ago, it was normal in Norway to uh, for translations into Norwegian to use the dialects to give different color to two styles from uh, translated literature. Uh, but that's not so popular anymore. So it's uh, also different uh, fashions uh, on how to solve these things, which is very interesting to discuss with the translators. But it's it's in the end them and uh, the authors together who has to solve it. And it's a puzzle, but it's what they give them meaning for their job, I think. A cat in a Hong Kong, how do you play out between a Mandarin and Cantonese and all of the other languages that you have to wrestle with in the region? And how does that work in terms of translations? Is there an interest? Uh, is it mostly about writing in English or translated into English? Or is there a now, especially today, a growing interest to be able to understand the Chinese mainland uh, mindset through literature? And how does that play out through translation? Yeah, I think, you know, historically, um, the, the festival has often, you know, had primarily English sessions um, and sort of, you know, English language in English literature and kind of um, been a platform for that and, um, you know, promoting that in, in Hong Kong. But I think, you know, increasingly there is, uh, we have had many more Cantonese sessions um, over the last few years. The last festival, we had quite a few um, Cantonese sessions that were really well attended. Um, we've had, you know, even sort of, you know, uh, graphic novels with hardly any kind of writing in there, but then it's really about kind of, you know, hearing hearing those kind of authors and, you know, uh, 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 designers kind of speak and talking about language beyond just, you know, the kind of the written word. So I think, you know, we've had quite a wide range. Uh, we've been talking about podcasts and kind of, you know, audio, um, you know, not, you know, audio ways of listening to, to, to stories. So it's kind of beyond just kind of the written word, I, I would say. Um, and certainly um, with our, our Young Readers Festival as well, we kind of have a, have a range of different authors from, you know, glo globally um, with, you know, different languages as well. So, um, yeah, I think definitely there's a, there's a strong mix, but primarily with the English and, and Cantonese. Catherine, at the Frankfurt Book Fair, what I loved most was the lifestyle area where you could go and uh, connect with the chefs and all of the lifestyle writers and sample a, a little bit of food, etc. And in many ways, it, it again did what translation does, right? It allows you access to a different world, but through food. And similarly, would you all consider, for example, highlighting, say, climate change by creating an area which is in an arid desert or where, which is completely flooded and you have to walk over something or uh, when you're going to focus on the war in the region with tanks and rockets sort of, you know, uh, being the sentinel gatekeepers to a new zone. The question I'm asking is, what is the role today of trying to create an immersive experience, not just in literature platforms like we have, but also like you have, especially as you've done uh, in the food segment, which I thought worked beautifully. I, so unfortunately, we didn't have the food sector last year, but um, our guest of honor, Canada, who has, uh, who has actually two years of, of, of a guest of honor presence in Frankfurt, the first being virtually only, but they um, designed their, they designed the first virtual pavilion. The guest of honor pavilion was also accessible for all the Canadians who couldn't travel and they had access to it and they still have access to it now. Um, and also I, I really liked and I, I really thought that that was very immersive is how they incorpor incorporated the Canadian authors who couldn't travel into this um, uh, presence and into the uh, pavilion. So I think that that was really a first step into, um, in, in, into creating a, a fully immersive experience in Frankfurt that is accessible both virtually and physically. 
Um, but I think that is a really good idea. What, what you uh, what you just mentioned to sort of think about how how to create a. Uh, a, a theme that is that will also demonstrate the uh, the climate change. I think that's a really good um, idea. Yeah. Sadaf, um, again going back to conflict, fifty years, Bangladesh since Bangladesh uh, attained independence, fifty very hard fought years because you continued to fight even after having uh, achieved independence, and incredible writing that came out of that period. Some of it buried because as governments change the narrative of the victorious uh, women generals in this case, uh, change the narrative. How do you see um, that sort of playing out now into the future? Uh, even as Bangladesh today emerges out of the shadows of the rest of the subcontinent, its mortality rate, its infant mortality rate is down, its women uh, empowerment is you know, soaring, uh, the per capita income is, uh, you know, excellent in compared to the rest of the neighborhood. Do you see this sort of impacting on the writing that comes out? Has the writing changed uh, to begin with? And, and where does conflict play in this new season of writing, even as you emerge into a, a very bright future compared to much around you? Uh, I well, I think that it, it's on two levels. So uh, I, think, I think a lot of exciting expression and writing came out after 71 because it was kind of breaking the shackles of uh, a certain structure, uh, certain, I think probably intellectual structure as well. So there was a lot of very interesting um, theater that was coming out. There was a lot of interesting writing. And now as we are kind of repositioning and, and as you said, there's a lot of, um, energy and excitement uh, because you know Bangladesh is doing so well in so many areas but at the same time um, it also makes us question we are also a lot of us at the time where you know young people are looking for some kind of meaning to their life because maybe certain basics are kind of now being taken care of so it, they are they are now you know very I think thirsty and hungry to sort of make sense of the past, make sense of the, wh what we're going on, you know, standing up when they see injustice um, and trying to figure out how best to, uh, you know, tackle the kind of challenges that we're seeing. And, and, and I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, uh, when we were talking about, you know, the, ch the challenge of, you know, still the stranglehold of patriarchy. Yes, women are doing very well, but it, but they are coming across all new forms of violence against women. And I think it's frightening also how some of the old patriarchal structures are still very much in place and, and, and perhaps being expressed in different ways. Um, so we're seeing a lot of um, uh, issues on online violence against women and trolling. And so I think that there are some like very, very deep rooted uh, challenges that definitely remain. And, you know, this is coming out in different um, writings and novels and poetry. Um, and, and you were talking about different types of expression. I think young people are coming out with saying poetry in different way, are exploring different ways of, you know, writing the novel. And I, I think we will see a kind of resurgence or a renaissance of the, the performance space as well um where we're trying to find different ways of I, I guess coming to terms with our past but also kind of um exploring an exciting future but at the same time realizing there are cer certain things that even from our colonial past that we have to deal with and then for the more immediate past that we haven't been able to you know break out of yet very quickly i'm going to go to closing comments because we seem to have run out of time uh, market Taking from what Sadaf said, war against women and children is an eternal, ever-growing war. It's not, it does, it's not specific to a region or a people. It's worldwide, and you see it every day in every place. Is there a strategy that Norla has to address this through writing and translation? Uh, we, we bring the books uh, and the authors uh, as many places as we can in the world. And we think it's important to, uh, to be present uh, where literature is uh, discussed at uh, as many literature festivals as we can, because uh, it means that it gives us a 
chances to to discuss and to present uh, what we uh, what we have in the books. So uh, we present the literature, uh, and it's especially the children's literature uh, in Norway, which is brave in the way that it it mentions a lot of different topics that can be difficult to discuss many places. And uh, we we try to uh, to present these books and bring them to the to the audience as much as we can. And sometimes, uh, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead, Margaret. No, no, that's uh, that's uh, what we think that it's important for us to represent the 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 breadth, uh, the total amount of literature, and not to. Uh, to just focus on some uh, books that we we would like that the richness and the variety of voices uh, is what is uh, we are known to present in a way. So out from that, uh, it is a contribution to the debate on a lot of different uh, um, topics that are there are different meanings about. Christina. Margaret talked about brave, and uh, as she sort of summed it up, do you have a word that sums up the platform that you have or the platform that literature presents? Yes, I mean, brave uh, nuances, diversity, plurality, I think. One word, one word, one, just one. Oh, from... <laughs> just one word. Um, I don't know, I think conversations. Um, yeah, I'm conversations. <laughs> Cat? One word to represent. One word. <laughs> We're all, we, you know, we all like to talk a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's sort of fundamentally about, you know, increasing understanding and perspectives. So, you know, different perspe perspectives. Um, perspectives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Catherine, one word. I would say it's inclusive. Including. International inclusive, and inclusive. Perspective, brave, amazing. Sadaf, the last word to you. Plurality. <laughs> Plurality. Catherine. Or Kat, Catherine, Sadaf, Margaret, Christina, thank you so much for joining us in this particular uh, Director's Roundtable as part of the Jaipal Richard Festival ongoing program. I wish, as I said, we could have done this uh, together on ground. We look forward to hosting you perhaps in 2023 or during 2022 in one of our many iterations somewhere in the world. But till then, stay safe. Hopefully, this conflict that we all seem to be part of, be it COVID or the war that's just broken out in Europe, or the war against mental health, drugs, violence, terror, all of this we can make sense of through literature. Thank you all. Thank you, Catherine, Christina, Catherine Gruen, Margaret, and Sada for that amazing conversation. And thank you, Sanjoy, for being a fabulous moderator. And thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation. Thank you once again and see you soon.